Hello, everyone. Um, it's really nice to have you all here today. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are right now. Uh, we are going to start the webinar in about uh, 20 minutes from now. So again, thank you so much for coming. Uh, and uh, just uh, we request you to please keep your mics and video muted during the webinar and use the chat box to leave your questions. We will be pleased to take up all these questions during the discussion session after the end of this uh, webinar. So please stay tuned and all the certificates will be um, emailed to you after the webinar. Um, it will take about um, um, seven days, maybe. So again, thank you so much for coming.
Uh, greetings to everyone. Good morning, good evening, uh, wherever you are right now. So again, thank you so much for coming today. We will be starting shortly in about three minutes as soon as uh, uh, we have the pleasure of having Professor Michael Orton with us. It's quite early in Phoenix right now. He was so kind to allocate a very appropriate time that was uh, convenient for most of us around the world to be online. So it's amazing to have him here today. Uh, we request you to please uh, use the chat chat box to leave your questions that will be taken up by us by the end of uh, the webinar. We will discuss all of your questions and queries in details. And I've also shared um, the link to our WhatsApp group as well as our um, website address. So you can uh, just to stay updated from all our activities. Uh, we have started this platform to make it possible for everyone to uh, have the privilege of, uh, you know, attending all of this um, wonderful activities that we think we may organize, please feel free to um, leave your comments and suggestions for future programs. Uh, Professor Adrian, I can see you uh, here in, in, the, in the Zoom link. Sir, thank you so much for coming. It's a matter of huge honor to have you with us today, Professor Adrian. Uh, I think you are... Uh, 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 I think you are, uh, um, you might be muted. Thank you so much, sir, for coming. Professor Adjun is a very famous uh, pediatric neurosurgeon from Costa Rica. It's a matter of huge honor to have known him and to have the privilege of uh, having him uh, in, during our ISPN webinars as well. Sir, thank you so much for coming. It's a matter of real honor to have you with us today. Hello, Maria. Nice to meet you again. Thank you so much, sir. It's so great to see you, sir. I've been telling uh, my attendees uh, about uh, your academic and educational contributions for neurosurgery, especially for pediatric neurosurgery. It was a real a matter of honor to have to have the privilege of meeting you uh, during the ISBN annual uh, conference in Singapore a few months ago. Oh, very nice to meet you too. And um, Thank you. I congratulate you on your academic activities. I think this is uh, very helpful for many people and Thank many so students. Much. Thank you so much. That is so kind of you, sir. Indeed, it's a matter of real honor for me to hear such nice words of appreciation uh, because uh, you are like a huge inspiration for all of us. So it's a real big thing. Thank you so much, sir. Sir, I can see Professor Michael Watson has just joined us. So again, uh, hello, sir. Good morning. Hello, sir. Professor Michael Lawton has just uh, joined us. Good morning. Good morning, sir. How are you? I'm doing great, sir. Thank you so much, sir. It's so kind of you uh, to join us today. And I know it's too early uh, for you uh, in Phoenix right now. It's 6 a.m. in the morning. Yeah, it's quite early. <laughs> yeah, sir, it's so kind of you for accepting our request because it really, you know, matters to us to have you here with us today. It's so kind of you. You always have a lot of dedication, and I think uh, you are a huge, one of the biggest inspirations for all of us. So again, uh, thank you for this huge uh, privilege to uh, join us today and this early. Right. So I think it's time for us to start the webinar. Um, uh, sir, if you are ready, may I uh, start the webinar now? If you are me too. Yeah, I, I'm having a, <clears throat> I'm having some issues with my video. Uh, for some reason, it's not um, it's not turning on. Oh, okay. I see. So, sure. Please take your time. Hold on a sec. Let me try one thing. Uh, I have uh, already shared a lot of uh, relevant links with all uh, of you in my WhatsApp group. So I hope that uh, most of you have gone through the wonderful um, work of Professor Michael Lurton. And most of us already have uh, read all these things, obviously, and uh, we are already um, in touch with all his new publications as well, all the wonderful work. Basically, you know, it is um, what we also apply and use clinically. So, um, 
uh, still I have um, shared a few important points that were relevant with today's lecture. So um, I hope you have all received it. Okay, I sent you the link again. Surely I will send all these links that you can just keep in touch. Uh, before we start the webinar, I would like to add a couple of words um, before we just start our webinar um, in the end. But uh, we have just uh, seen the catastrophe being experienced by Turkey and Syria. So we want to share that our thoughts and our prayers are with Turkey and Syria during the given challenging situations caused by a massive earthquake. We can all feel the pain and share the grief with you and we wish recovery and safety to all. As, as Forbes has declared as the largest um, natural calamity of the century. So we can just uh, feel the pain and we are in this together. Whatever we can do, we can just send you wishes and prayers and if we can help, uh, if possible, then obviously um, I think we should promote this um, and uh, just uh, want to share uh, prayers and wishes for safety and protection to everyone around the world and everyone who is suffering right now and struggling to find their uh, you know, family members and who is still trying to survive in the hospitals and all the doctors who have been serving including um, teams from uh, our countries who have sent teams uh, for rescue missions we wish them the best to recover as many people as possible although the time has um, elapsed a lot but um, obviously our wishes and prayers are with you Well, I can't seem to fix my video. I'm sorry. Uh, it's not showing me, but I'm here. <laughs> sure, sir. No problem at all, sir. It's okay. Uh, sometimes that happens. I think Zoom has a little uh, issue with the uh, with video right now because I had a lot of problem setting up my own camera. So probably it's it's the app issue that's like, that's uh, having uh, a little facing this little glitch. So again, thank you so much, sir. Uh, I think uh, if you allow me i can uh, i will start the webinar as soon as you allow me to do so okay i'm ready thank you so much sir again thank you so much we are honored to welcome the legendary professor michael lawton today with us professor michael lawton does not need any introduction at mm -hmm. all but for the sake of formality i'm pleased to give a brief introduction professor michael lawton uh, is the president and ceo of barrow neurological institute and the chair of the department of neurological surgery uh, his expertise includes cerebrovascular diseases of course and cervical based tumors he has experience in treating more than 5200 brain aneurysms 900 than 90 AVMs and about a thousand cavernous malformations, including 300 in the brainstem and other delicate areas. We know him for his uh, Lawton Young um, supplementary grading system. I think it was the one of the earliest questions I've been asked when I started my own residency. So I know we had a case of AVM and they asked me this question. I, I, I was so happy that I knew it uh, back then. So it was um, like it's so much important clinically that we use it each day. Uh, but Professor Michael Lawton has also proposed this uh, grading system for the brainstem cavernous malformations. I have shared all these links on my WhatsApp group and on my Facebook, uh, so you can just go through them if you want to read the whole article. I think many of us already know it who are clinically practicing, so uh, most of us uh, are already using them as to just having a lot of good experience in um, knowing our own cases. So uh, the vital and uh, Lawton grading this supplementary is very uh, much uh, famous already, but the brainstem cavernoma is a real, it's a new one. So we all know about it, but we are just uh, going th through it, um, reading it. I've shared this link for with all of you. Uh, these are some of the very important papers. And we also know him for his seven series, the trilogy that has already been published. And indeed, it equates to the seven wonders uh, of neurological surgery. The seven cavernomas is a compilation of articles that have been published by 
the JNS, and I have also shared the link um, to, to that uh, compilation. You can find it. I will also share it again uh, in the chat box so that you can uh, find it if you um, haven't yet seen them. So it is um, something very important. Also, many of you might have seen uh, his uh, seven series videos on the BNI website, and these are really important for us, especially the young neurosurgeons who are just learning. And I think it's for the senior ones as well to have a very good insight uh, because mm, we know you cannot be um, he's a master and uh, some of sometimes we wonder how someone can operate that nicely in those precarious areas so it's um it's like when we invited you sir i was so overwhelmed and i told my colleagues about you so again thank you so much for coming today um, um it's, it's a matter of real honor and i think that uh, there is no description that describes what you have been doing for neurosurgery not only for the patient but also for the trainees on and everyone who is around the world and all your teachings is going to translate into a much better and improved healthcare. And um, we will uh, be having the privilege of inviting Professor Sessler Lawton next um, uh, in uh, on 19th February. So again, I really want to invite everyone who is here to please join us on 19th February to attend this lecture. Uh, Professor Lawton, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming, for accepting our invitation today. Uh, we are really honored and pleased to have you and we are obliged that you accepted our invitation even uh, during your very busy schedule and even it's quite early in um, your part of the world sir welcome and the floor is all yours now great thank you so much um i'd like to share my screen can you um enable that for me uh, sure sir i i just uh, see uh, if there is the... oh okay sorry uh, uh uh, sir, can you share your screen now? Let's try now. There we go. Okay. Perfect. Thank um, you so much. So, yeah, so um, you should see in just a second my title slide. Can you see that? Uh, perfectly, sir. Sorry? Perfectly, sir. We can see. Oh, okay, great. Perfectly. Great. Um, all right, well, thank you, Nora. Um, I appreciate the invitation and um, appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, just to be clear, um, what do we have? We have um, an hour? Sure, exactly. We do have an hour, but you can take as long as you like because uh, uh, this is uh, solely your own show. So you can take okay. as long as you like. Okay, I have to be finished at uh, seven o'clock my time. Uh, because I have another meeting to go to, but um, so I'll I'll go ahead and get going. Um, so what I thought I would talk about is um, brainstem cavernous malformations, and as um, as mentioned, I've been um, focused on these over the last um, two years, just trying to put my next book together, which uh, we're almost done with. Um, the uh, the book is on um, cavernous malformations throughout the brain, and it's coming out as a collection in. Uh, JNS. And, you know, the goals for the book were to, um, like for some of the others, develop a, a taxonomy for cavernous malformations, um, talk about tissue sparing approaches to get there, and then um, overall just uh, to improve the uh, clinical diagnosis and decision making that goes into the management. So um, that was the uh, the goal of the, uh, the book. Um, and uh, it will come out uh, once we finish the last of the journal papers. Um, so these are some of the numbers um, at last tally, um, a lot of cases. So, um, you know, I, I always I feel blessed. I, I feel the need to take my experience and um, convert that into lessons um, for others to, uh, to learn from because it's um, not everybody who gets to, to do these kinds of numbers. And that's um, partly what motivates me. This is the outline for the talk. We'll, get through as much of this as we can uh, in the next uh, 50 minutes or so. Uh, so let's get started. The first is patient selection. Um, it's always hard to, to pick these because, um, you know, doing surgery on the brainstem can be um, very uh, morbid for, for patients if, pa if you don't select the right ones. And so one of the early uh, goals was to try and find a grading system for these patients that does that didn't exist. And so we put this together as one of the first papers um, 
um, in this whole effort. And um, when we looked at our experience and our statistics, we found that there were five variables that mattered. There was there was um, size crossing the axial midpoint, uh, the presence of a DVA, age and hemorrhage. And um, these were the, the ones that kind of came out of the statistical analysis. And we did a grading system that was not unlike the Spencer Martin or supplementary grading, where you look at these factors, you assign these cut points, and then give um, uh, points based upon um, the criteria. And you'll notice a couple of things. First, um, age has a cut point that's at 40, um, and it's a zero or two, unlike um, the um, uh, AVM grading system that has uh, three tiers. With hemorrhage, we have three tiers with zero, one, and two for acute, subacute, and chronic hemorrhage. And um, you know the, the the way I remember all of these different variables is is it's not unlike AVM grading, where you have a size, an eloquence variable, which here we refer to as crossing the axial mid midpoint, and venous drainage is kind of like the presence of the DVA. So you can remember the first three like Spetzler Martin grading, and you can remember the last two like um, supplementary grading where you have an age variable and you have um, uh, a bleeding variable, uh, except that it's timing rather than yes, no. So anyway, um, this is how the, uh, the brainstem grading system gets put together. And when you look at the numbers, um, at least from that initial series, um, they were quite small in these lower uh, or high grade uh, patients. And so uh, one of the first things we did in the series was to validate the grading system in my patients that came afterwards, plus Dr. Spetzler's page, patients. And um, what we found, um, you can see the different approaches here. We found um, a lot of similarity between the ways that uh, he and I operate, uh, which was uh, no surprise. We saw a good distribution of the uh, cavernous malformations by grade. And um, what we found was that they kind of distribute themselves into low, intermediate, and high grades, low being 0, 1, 2, intermediate being 3, 4, and 5, and high grade being 6 and 7. And there was this nice linear drop-off um, that correlated outcome with grade, which is exactly what you want a grading system to do. And it was true when you looked at both um, outcomes in terms of absolute outcomes, good and poor, um, or in terms of relative outcomes, whether the patients were worse or um, unchanged or better. And, and so um, the, the takeaway is that, um, you know, when you have um, um, high grade AVM patients, the, uh, uh, the sixes and the sevens, these are the ones to be careful of because you can see from these graphs, the, the risks go way up when you get into those, um, in those ranges. So um, you can use the brainstem cavernous malformation grading scale as a way to select your patients. And um, when they're lower intermediate grade, I think it's um, uh, fair game and safe to offer surgery. Uh, when you get into the high grade uh, patients, you need to be a little bit more cautious or not operate at all. Now, um, one of the most important things I think from this effort is this taxonomy. And so um, I've kind of, um, uh, I've, I've put these um, uh, taxon this techno taxonomy together in terms of types and subtypes with um, type referring to location in the midbrain pons and medulla and subtype referring to the location where the lesion surfaces, whether it's anterior, posterior, et cetera. Um, and so that's the way to think about the taxonomy. Uh, the data comes from my patients and Dr. Spetzler's patients, and we put these together in one database. And then um, this sort of summarizes how it works. If you look at the midbrain, uh, you see five different types. You've got intrapeduncular and peduncular in blue and red. You've got a lateral um, tegmental uh, zone here. You have a posterior one, and you've got a periaqueductal subtype. So the, these are the five subtypes within the midbrain. As we go to the pons, um, you see the color coding is the same. We have an anterior uh, um, subtype here that's called the basilar uh, subtype. You've got a peritrigeminal one here in red. We've got a middle peduncular here in orange, inferior peduncular in green, and a rhomboid 
uh, one here in blue. And if you look in this central zone here, this yellow, uh, this is the super olivary subtype, which um, uh, comes into the central ponds from below, which is a very uh, sneaky way to get into the central ponds from a far lateral approach, which we'll talk about later. Moving on to the medulla, you can see uh, we've got the pyramidal, the olivary, the cuneate, the gracile, and then down here in the ventricle, we've got the trigonal, which is the lower part of the floor of the fourth ventricle. So those are the zones. There are 16 uh, subtypes. You can uh, see this table here. If you remember the various names of the, um, the subtypes, you'll, you'll remember the zones because they're very anatomically described. Um, and they'll lead you right to the correct name. And the whole key to the taxonomy is just learning these names, learning the anatomy that defines the, the different uh, territories, and then doing the correct categorization. This is just another view. Um, this just shows you the midbrain ponds and medulla. You can see this is the anterior view. So we see nicely the interpeduncular, the basilar, and the pyramidal. Uh, subtypes. As we go into the red zones, you can see peduncular, um, you can see the um, uh, peritrigeminal here in the ponds, and you can see olivary down here. As we uh, go around more laterally, uh, you start to see the orange territory of the tegmental, middle peduncular, and cuneate zones. And then um, on this next slide, we're going around to the back where you can see quadrigeminal you can see the floor of the fourth ventricle, the rhomboid and the trigonals. And, uh, and then lastly, the green zones, the gracile, the inferior peduncular and periaqueductal up at the top. So um, um, that's the taxonomy. Uh, one other thing we wanted to introduce was this notion of giant cavernomas. Uh, we have a giant definition for aneurysms for uh, AVMs for pituitary lesions, um, but not for cavernomas. And so we we threw this one out there. Um, we looked at the relative risks of a functional decline. And um, we found that as the size grew from two and a half centimeters all the way up to four, the greatest um, change in outcome was after three. You can see this jump here. And, and so we decided that um, this was a good cut point for the, the definition of giant. And so we we, we view anything that's three centimeters or greater as a giant lesion. And uh, that's what we recommend as the um, kind of the, uh, the cutoff for the definition. The graph here just shows you that unlike a lot of lesions, tumors, for example, or aneurysms, the size of a cavernous malformation is dynamic. Uh, it generally is increasing, but sometimes it can decrease um, as the blood gets reabsorbed. Uh, sometimes it can jump up quite dramatically with a, with a hemorrhage and so forth. So you, you have to always sort of reassess the size uh, of the lesion. Now, um, one of the things that um, the taxonomy tells you is, um, is what clinical constellation or syndrome you can expect with these patients. The anatomy of the brainstem is so loaded that lesions in specific areas um, will tell you exactly what subtype you're dealing with. Um, it, it's not unlike what um, we learned from the stroke syndromes um, many, many uh, decades ago by our um, astute neurologist. The, the symptoms from a stroke would tell you exactly what part of the brainstem the stroke was in. Well, the same is true with um, cavernous malformations. You can see if you look at the subtypes according to their, um, their different uh, symptomatology, each one of these columns has a different heat map, a different pattern of green and red. And so there, there is this uh, constellation of symptoms that really matches the syndrome here. And so you can really um, come to your diagnosis of the malformation just by having a really good neurological bedside exam and recognizing the, uh, the syndrome and pairing that with the, uh, with the subtype. So I'll show you some examples. The interpeduncular, uh, lesion is shown here. Uh, this is the um, uh, the Claude syndrome, and uh, you can see how um, a lesion in the interpeduncular fossa affects the red nucleus and the third nerve. So you have a contralateral cerebellar ataxia and an ipsilateral ocular motor nerve palsy. And the presence of those symptoms will lead you right to this localization 
of the cavernous malformation. Uh, if we go on to the pedunculate lesion, uh, this is your uh, classic um, Weber syndrome. And so instead of the um, uh, um, ataxia, this is more uh, in the, uh, the peduncle. And so you have a contralateral hemiparesis or hemiplegia with your third nerve palsy. And that localizes or identifies the uh, peduncular subtype rather than the interpeduncular subtype. As we go around to the tegmentum, uh, for some of these, we just didn't find an equivalent or pre-existing uh, stroke syndrome. So we, we have to define our own. This is what we call a lemniscal syndrome uh, because it impacts the uh, trigeminal, the medial, and lateral lemnisci in this tegmental zone of the posterolateral lateral midbrain. Uh, you can see how it um, affects those tracts. It will cause facial numbness. It will cause pain and temperature disruption, and it will affect uh, vibration and fine touch. So it, it really hits those three uh, tracks. And in addition, uh, the spinal thalamic tract, which is your pain and temperature tract, which is uh, sitting right here next to the medial lemniscus. Moving around to the quadrigeminal plate, we all know paranoid syndrome with um, paresis of up gaze, light near dissociation. And this comes from these lesions back here, right around the posterior commissure and um, superior colliculi and affecting the, uh, the nerve nuclei here. Um, periaqueductal lesions can cause a Nothnagel syndrome. Uh, and um, it's very much like the Claude syndrome, but, but usually a little lower down, uh, depending on where you are relative to the decusation of the uh, superior cerebellar peduncle. That will um, determine whether your ataxia is ipsy or contralateral. And, um, uh, you've got your um, oculomotor nerve paresis as well. So um, this is just uh, to show you how, you know, you can go through all of these, the pons, you can go through uh, the various uh, pontine syndromes that correlate. You have the peritrigeminal syndromes that affect the um, uh, both the uh, corticospinal tract and the MCP here and cause some ataxia. You have the, uh, the middle peduncular lesions that cause ipsilateral face, uh, hemisensory loss, the contralateral uh, medial lemniscus symptoms, uh, the spinal thalamic tract. And um, you, you can essentially make your diagnoses without MRIs. You can make it with just um, a good clinical examination and this um, putting together of the findings. The INO is classic for lesions in the floor of the fourth ventricle in the pontine segment. And these are the various types of an INO that you can get uh, depending on the level of the lesion. Um, here's this super olivary pontine lesion. This is classic, causes a six nerve palsy, ipsilateral to the lesion as the nerve exits the pontomedullary sulcus. And um, um, sometimes you'll get a fifth or a seventh nerve associated with that as well, shown here, uh, the Miller Gubler syndrome. And moving on down into the medulla, same story. You can get a pyramidal syndrome here with Desjardins syndrome with um, tongue deviation and a hemiparesis that is um, contralateral. You can get an olivary lesion here causing the anterior Wallenberg syndrome. And finally, um, the cuneate lesion um, causes a posterior Wall Wallenberg syndrome. And the, um, the ones towards the back are much easier. They affect the uh, um, uh, dorsal column nuclei here, just causing leg uh, numbness, isolated leg numbness that could be ipsy or uh, uh, bilateral. And then um, uh, trigonal. These are the ones in the floor of the fourth ventricle below the stria medullaris that cause um, uh, dysphagia and dysphonia, as well as severe nausea and vomiting. So that's a very quick run through the various clinical syndromes. Um, and, um, you know, hopefully you'll have time to look at the publications in more detail and study the, the, the illustrations. The illustrations are fantastic. Um, you know, I had my artists here work on those and um, they bring together these uh, wonderful circuits um, and uh, the pathology and the, they, they do require some study, but uh, I, I think uh, hopefully if you do that, you'll get a sense of um, how these lesions fit with the uh, with the pathways in the brainstem and cause these clinical constellations.
So <clears throat> moving on to the approaches, the, the real benefit in my mind of the taxonomy is the approach selection. I think one of the hardest things with these lesions is first patient selection, but then second, um, surgical selection. Should I uh, operate and, and how should I operate? And each one of these um, subtypes has its own unique uh, approach. And the beauty of the taxonomy is that if you categorize the, the lesion according to the subtype, it will pair the lesion with the what I would call the correct approach. And so um, that's really the beauty is you, you once you have a subtype, you have uh, it will lead you to the approach. And so I'll just walk you through um, through the approaches. This is the interpeduncular lesion. The approach is an orbitozygomatic craniotomy. And we're going to go transylvian and interpeduncular. And so this is the ultimate surgical view that you're going to get. It's very much like approaching a basilar apex aneurysm, where you go uh, lateral to the carotid, medial to the third nerve. You follow the third nerve back to the basilar apex. And just behind that, you're going to get to the interpeduncular fossa. You're going to work through the thalamoperforates, and you'll get uh, to the lesion here. There are safe entry zones that are available. Um, they are the um, uh, interpeduncular safe entry zone right in the middle. And um, you can see the valuable real estate is the red nuclei and the corticospinal tracts, which uh, lie just to the side. Um, so that's the interpeduncular approach. Uh, I'll skip uh, the videos in the interest of time uh, and just show you the artwork here. This next one is the peduncular lesion. Uh, this now is the same craniotomy same transylvian approach, but instead of going medial to the third nerve, we'll be going lateral to the third nerve, right to the, the uh, cerebral peduncle, which you see here. So our uh, safe entry zone, if necessary, is the anterior mesencephalic, straight ent uh, safe entry zone, and we have to stay medial to the corticospinal tract. The um, Oops, let me uh, skip this as well. The next one is the tegmental uh, cavernous malformation. I like to do these in the sitting position uh, through a retrosigmoid craniotomy. That allows the cerebellum to, to descend a little bit with gravity. And um, it takes us right to this uh, posterior lateral surface of the, um, of the midbrain. The fourth nerve you see right in the center here. And um, it's a very uh, helpful landmark that will guide your, your um, your dissection. Um, the distal branches of the SCA are also uh, right in the field. Um, so you have to choose a pathway either supratrochlear or infratrochlear, depending on where this comes to the surface. The um, lateral mesencephalic sulcus is your safe entry zone. It's where the cruce of the peduncle ends and the um, uh, tegmentum begins. And usually it's overlying, uh, overlied by this lateral mesencephalic vein, and you can enter right in that spot. The, um, the uh, next one here is the um, quadrigeminal um, lesion here. This one I do from a um, sitting position, again, uh, supracerebellar infratentorial uh, approach um, in the midline uh, through a torcular craniotomy. You see the torcular craniotomy here. Uh, straight down the middle, and it takes you to uh, what I refer to as the infragalenic triangle. It's that space between basal vein of Rosenthal, the precentral cerebellar vein, just right in that little angle right there. And uh, this gives you a perfect shot. Uh, there are multiple safe entry zones that you can use, the um, uh, intercollicular, supracollicular, or infracollicular safe entry zones. Uh, but typically, these lesions are right there on the surface, and um, you can get right to it uh, through uh, just entering the lesion directly. The uh, eloquent anatomy is shown in the lower right. You have to watch the superior and inferior colliculi. Deep to them is the red nucleus. You have the decussation of the fourth nerves um, below them, which you need to stay above. Uh, but this provides a very nice corridor. And with this gravity retraction and sitting position, uh, you have a nice open space. The, um, the next one is um, the periaqueductal. This one is um, uh, 
a beautiful approach. Uh, I do this through a bifrontal transcolossal transchoroidal fissure approach. You can see the uh, beautiful anatomy in this picture. With gravity, the, uh, the dependent hemisphere will drop so that you can get right down the interhemispheric fissure to the corpus callosum. A um, transcolossal dissection will take you into the lateral ventricle. As you open up the choroidal fissure, you enlarge the foramen of Monroe, which you see right here. You'll enlarge that backwards so that you open into the third ventricle. You come upon the mass of intermedia, you come upon the medial walls of the thalamus, and if you keep aiming back, you'll see the aqueduct. And these lesions typically sit along this rim, around the rim of the, um, uh, the aqueduct. So they're the, in the very top of the midbrain, which is the floor of the third ventricle, and uh, that will take you there. All right, so um, looking at the midbrain, you can see um, these are the different subtypes, the various um, uh, patient outcomes. And by and large, um, these approaches that I'm advocating uh, really uh, performed well. The patients did well, and um, you know we had, uh, we had uh, good outcomes seen. So um, next is the PONS. The, the PONS has uh, six subtypes and six different unique approaches, and I'll just uh, walk you through those. Uh, the first is the basilar subtype, and that for that we just do a terional with a quasi uh, uh, approach. So the quasi's bone of the uh, anterior petrous bone is shown here. Uh, the borders for that are the GSPN, lateral border of the fifth nerve, superior petrosal sinus and the petrous ridge, and arcuate eminence. I think all of you are well aware of quasi's triangle, and when you open that space and work between five and seven, you have a nice shot at the anterior surface of the pons. You can see your lateral to the basilar. You're working between these um, circumflex perforators off of the basilar trunk, and this provides your window. Um, the, these lesions sit medial to what I call the trans olivary line. This is a term from Roten, uh, drawing a line up from the uh, midpoint of the olive. Or um, the sixth nerve will give you a sense of that, uh, that same uh, anatomy. And so if you see six and you're medial to six, you're in that basilar territory. The ob uh, obviously, the key um, eloquent structures here are the descending corticospinal tract fibers. And those are shown in blue here, and those have to be carefully protected. So um, the next one is um, the uh, peritrigeminal. Uh, we see a lot of these. These are uh, lesions that are located on the anteromedial uh, surface of the, um, uh, or the, sorry, the anterolateral surface of the pons, and um, they're right uh, around the, uh, the trigeminal uh, nerve. They're, they're medial to the nerve, uh, typically above or below. Uh, you can see um, in this illustration, this one is sitting above. I do an extended retrosigmoid approach and a um, dissection through the cerebellopontine angle. That will take you right to the lesion. The, um, the safe or the triangular spaces of access are either super trigeminal, infra trigeminal, uh, or uh, you can go even lower into the GCT or the glossopharyngeal cochlear triangle. So you see those three different areas of access into the cerebello cerebellopontine cistern and those get you medial to the, the cranial nerves into this, this next strip of the pontine surface. The, um, the next uh, territory here is the middle peduncular lesions. Now these are gonna be lateral to, um, uh, the entry site I should say, is lateral to the cranial nerves. The lesion itself is, um, is in the, the lateral portion of the pons where the middle cerebellar peduncle overlies that lateral surface. But to get to these, you enter through the, the, uh, the MCP or the middle cerebellar peduncle. The, the way that you get in is you have to separate the petrosal fissure. It's the uh, otherwise known as the horizontal fissure. It separates the superior and the inferior semilunar lobules. It sits uh, just above the flocculus. So you have to split this like you would a sylvian fissure. And the way I like to do that, I like to look for the ICA as it comes around the, um, uh, the brainstem, and it will dive into that horizontal fissure 
And so by following the, ar the arterial branches into the fissure, you'll separate the two lobules and you'll get right down on this um, lateral extent of the MCP, which will um, take you to the entry site. Now, it's very rare that these come to the surface. The, I did one the other day that was just right on the surface here, but most of the time you've got to do a, um, a safe entry through the, the white matter track of the peduncle and uh, get, get your way down to the lesion in that manner. And so um, um, this is just uh, an example of what that looks like. This is the, uh, the uh, horizontal fissure here, Ica's coming in here. You have to separate this to get your way into, the, uh, into that space. Now, the inferior peduncular one is um, really a, a approach into the lateral recess of the fourth ventricle. I use a suboccipital craniotomy, a telovelar approach. If you take down the inferior medullary vellum, you follow the choroid plexus out into the lateral recess and then jump above that. This is where these inferior peduncular lesions will live. It's basically in the ICP uh, as the ICP curves into the peduncle above the choroid in, uh, and above the lateral recess. So um, your safe entry zone for this, if you need it, is in the area acoustica. Uh, you've got to be careful of the vestibular nuclei and the uh, nuclei in the floor of the fourth ventricle. Um, these can be uh, very costly. So ideally, you want the lesion right there on the, on the brainstem surface. The, um, the next one is the rhomboid. These are moving more medially in the floor of the fourth ventricle. These sit above the stria medullaris. That's our dividing line between medulla below it and pons above it. And here you have to worry about the facial colliculus. The facial colliculus is um, where the facial nerve wraps around the sixth nerve nucleus. And so um, the lesion has to be on the surface uh, through that ependymal uh, surface, or uh, you have to map it out using uh, stimulation mapping so that you can select your entry zone uh, either above or below the facial colliculus. Last but not least is the super olivary lesions. These um, <clears throat> are right at the pontomedullary sulcus. Uh, the approach is through a far lateral exposure. Uh, you go through the vago accessory triangle, which is the space between the inferior margin of 10 and just uh, lateral to the 11th nerve, and it's right there. It's right in that space there. And um, these are uh, beautiful lesions because, you know, it's um, uh, by going through that sulcus, you can get upwards into the pods. Your viewing angle from the far lateral exposure is upwards. So uh, you have a good trajectory into that space and um, uh, you can get uh, to these lesions uh, quite nicely. So uh, here's our table for the pods, again, showing the six different subtypes, good results with each of them. And it just validates the, uh, the approach recommendations that we're making here. Now onto the medulla. The medulla will be easy because we've already talked about most of these approaches, uh, but you can see the five different approaches for the pyramidal lesions. We're gonna do a far lateral, but to, to get around the corner uh, and medial to the olive, you, you really have to um, push the far lateral a little, a little bit. Uh, I like to uh, go in front of the 11th nerve and uh, really um, uh, drive the, the view as far forward as you can. And in these uh, cases, you can see around the corner to the, uh, to the pyramids. For the next one, the olivary ones, these are easier. Uh, here, you don't have to get medial to the hypoglossal nerve rootlets. You're basically between 9, 10, and 11 posteriorly and 12 anteriorly, right in the, in the olive itself. And uh, you can uh, uh, access these through the, the vago accessory triangle. It's very much like a pica aneurysm. This is where most of the pica approaches will take you. Um, and so pica is running right by, but you can see this lesion comes right uh, to the surface and uh, that's what you look for. There are safe entry options here in the olivary zone or in this retro olivary sulcus here, um, if necessary. The, um, the next one here is the, uh, the cuneate uh, nucleus. So this is basically a lesion that's in the um, uh, cuneate tubercle or the cuneate nucleus. It's below the lateral recess. So it's posterolateral. 
The gracile tubercle, we'll talk about it in a minute, but that's just medial uh, or paramedian. And um, this one again requires a telovelar approach, taking down that inferior medullary vellum and getting out uh, a little bit more laterally. The, uh, the gracile lesion shown here is uh, uh, really uh, more medial um, and uh, it's usually um, at the level of the obex. Um, and uh, th these are really quite easy to get to because they're uh, so accessible. Um, uh, last but not least is this uh, trigonal lesion. These are in the floor of the fourth ventricle. They're in the medulla, so they're below the stria medullaris. You have here your hypoglossal trigone uh, here. You have your vagal trigone uh, below and lateral to that. And you have your area postrema. These are what form the calamus scriptorius of the fourth ventricle floor. And so lesions there, you uh, really uh, look for them either being right there on the surface, or sometimes you can go down the median sulcus safely and get to those if they're in the midline. So uh, here's our table for the, uh, the medullary lesions, again, showing the, uh, the five different types, good outcomes with these, and um, uh, again, validating the, uh, the approaches. <clears throat> Now, um, the next topic is the topic of triangles. And, um, you know, with triangles, um, I I've always liked triangles. They um, deepen our anatomical knowledge. And more importantly, um, they're landmarks when you're doing your dissection. If, if you're getting lost, if you're having a tough time finding your target, the triangle will help guide you. It's kind of like landing lights for an airplane during fog. Uh, and and I, I view them as... Um, these really hard and fast um, uh, landmarks that will get you or, or orient you as you find your way to these targets. Um, the triangle concept, um, uh, I'll talk about it in a minute, but we, we've come up with this um, system of 14 brainstem triangles, some of which already existed like the Kawazi triangle. Others we uh, invented because um, there wasn't anything there and we needed to kind of put something out there. So. The, the ones in, um, in uh, kind of orange, uh, we, we published uh, as they relate to aneurysms or bypasses um, previously. The, um, the ones in white, like carotid ocular motor and quasi already existed. These, um, the ones in, in yellow are relatively new triangles or new names of triangles, which, um, you know, like infragalenic, we all know that, but um, if you start talking about it with the with a consistent um, name, um, we'll all be speaking the same language. So interlobular, we talked about for the um, uh, trans MCP approach. Th these are uh, new triangles that I think uh, are helpful to uh, to kind of put out there. Um, the the triangle concept um, is. It comes from um, target shooting. And when you think about um, trying to hit a target with a rifle or a gun, what you're doing when you're aiming is you've got a rear sight and a front sight. And in order to increase the accuracy of the shot, you have to line the two sights together. It's not enough just to have a rear sight or a front sight, but by having both and aligning your target with both of those, you, you're really steering the gun barrel to match the. Uh, um, to, to, to hit the target. And the analogy um, really applies for the surgical uh, approach. You need a craniotomy, which is your rear sight. You need a front sight, which is the triangle. And the approach is really just the gun barrel. And that gets you going down the right pathway, but you, you need that front sight to really uh, aim the, uh, the gun properly. So, um, these are the triangles, and and these, um, if you think about the triangles in that manner, you know you have to select your craniotomy and approach, but the triangle will really uh, specify exactly where you need to go. Um, these are some of the triangles. Um, I'll just uh, show this overview picture, uh, but we'll walk through some of these. The carotid ocular motor triangle, I think, is very familiar to everybody from aneurysm surgery uh, between the carotid and the third nerve. The um, ocular motor tentorial triangle is shown here. It's between the tentorium and the third nerve lateral to the ocular motor triangle. Uh, the supracerebellar triangles, there are two of them. Uh, there's one that's super, super trochlear. 
So as we go over the cerebellum and over the trochlear nerve, we can get into this um, space here. These are typically best for the more medial lesions. And as we go more lateral, um, the, uh, the trochlear nerve drops a bit and uh, we're, we're in this space here. Uh, so you can see here for this lesion, we're underneath the trochlear nerve to get to this one. So two triangles in that space. The infragalenic triangle, we uh, discussed this a little bit. It's between BVR uh, and the precentral cerebellar vein gets you to the quadrigeminal uh, or tectal plate. Kawazi's triangle, uh, we all know this from our skull base approaches, under the fifth nerve, over the seventh and eighth nerve, and through that, those two dural leaflets of the petrous apex. The super trigeminal triangle here, um, you, you see the fifth nerve here, and we're going to go over the uh, or above the fifth nerve, below the tentorium through a retrosigmoid approach. The infratrigeminal uh, triangle here is uh, under five and over eight in this space here. And then GCT or glossopharyngeal cochlear is obviously between eight and nine um, to get to that uh, lower portion of the pons. The interlobular triangle is the approach to the MCP, splitting that um, uh, horizontal fissure and following the ICA branches down to that surface of the MCP laterally. The vertebrobasilar junctional triangle is what we use for the pyramidal lesions. This is following the confluence of the vertebral arteries you see here, V4, right and left. And just in the crotch of those arteries is this triangle and that gets you to the, the pyramids on the medullary surface. Here's our famous vago accessory triangle between 11 and 10 and the surface of the medulla. Here's the molecular triangle. We all know this from our uh, suboccipital exposures, but uh, the molecula is the space between the tonsils. And so we, we've named this the molecular triangle and this opens up that, uh, that pathway. And finally, the uh, subtonsillar triangle. When you lift the tonsil on one side, that's what allows you to follow the inferior medullary vellum out into the lateral recess and get into those spaces for the cuneate lesions, the inferior pedunculate lesions, and so forth. So at the end of the day, we end up with this table. Uh, this table basically shows you types and subtypes in this first column. These are the, the numbers or the patient data that we, uh, we use for, for this. Um, and with each one of these, you have an approach, a triangle, and a safe entry zone. And so by putting all of this together uh, in your mind, um, you, you can use these, um, these associations to really plan your surgery. You know, if you're going to go for a tegmental lesion, you're going to do a supracerebellar infratentorial approach, either paramedian or lateral. You'll choose either a supratrochlear or an infratrochlear triangle, depending on where the lesion sits. And if you need a safe entry zone, it'll be your lateral mesencephalic sulcus safe entry zone and so forth on down the table. Each one of these has a unique combination of approach, triangle and safe entry zone. All right, so that's the concept. You know, you wanna bring these three things together and uh, by doing so, you'll make good surgical decisions. Um, this is an interesting graph that we made uh, you can see the types and the subtypes to your left, but the, the point of the table is that if you just chose the craniotomy and we're thinking only in terms of the craniotomy, um, you don't have the specificity to get you to your targets. These bands here are too thick. And um, even if you look at the approach, sometimes the, the approach isn't enough to get you to the, uh, to the exact spot that you need at the end of the day. Um, and so um, by adding the triangle and, and thinking about your safe entry zone, this is really what adds the specificity to your, to your surgical plan. And so um, this is how it all comes together. Now about the safe entry zones, um, you know, um, the safe entry zones are shown here. Um, these are areas that are typically based upon anatomy, uh, working in spaces around known uh, tracks or nuclei. Um, and um, you know, th this just nicely summarizes the various safe entry zones that we have available. Um, I, I think this is worth uh, also spending some time memorizing because um, not infrequently you'll do a, 
an approach, you'll do your uh, dissection, you'll get to the surface of the brainstem and you'll find that the lesion you thought was gonna be right there on the surface is actually below. And now you don't know where to go. Uh, and so you really need to know um, these safe entry zones. You can rely on neuro navigation to get you there, but it's also very important that, um, uh, that you know the anatomy and can use the safe entry zone to, uh, to make these choices. So these are uh, the safe entry zones. And uh, one of the things that we wanted to prove is that um, um, when you use a safe entry zone, it's in fact safe. So um, what we did is we compared uh, superficial lesions with deep lesions. The superficial ones did not require the use of a, um, uh, of a safe entry zone. The deep ones did. And what we then did was we uh, compared the patient outcomes. Uh, and you have your deep and your superficial data here. And we didn't find any differences between cranial nerve deficits, overall outcomes, uh, final MRS scores, and so forth. And what that tells us is that um, it is, in fact, safe to use these. As difficult as it is to make an incision in normal brainstem and go through normal looking tissue, um, what our data tells us is that it's safe. You can actually um, expect the results to be the same uh, whether you use it or not. So um, obviously you wanna uh, select the lesions that are on the surface if you can, but if you have to um, use a safe entry zone, you can feel confident. All right, um, <clears throat> arteries. So um, I wanna make a few comments about the arteries because you know we've talked about triangles as a guiding landmark, but um, the arteries are also very helpful in guiding you there. Um, <laughs> We helped um, put together this alphanumeric nomenclature for arterial segments with Dr. Roten uh, because we wanted to um, use that for bypass description. But as it turns out, um, you can use uh, the, the, that same arterial uh, nomenclature to help guide your dissection. So uh, what this table is showing us here is that depending upon the subtype, there's going to be basically a, a pathway of arteries arterial segments that you can follow that will take you from your superficial dissection all the way down to your target. And um, uh, there's some nice illustrations here that demonstrate that. Here is the interpeduncular cavernous malformation. You can see it between the peduncles and the midbrain. And just by following the arteries from your M2 down to your M1, down to your um, carotid artery, and then the anterocoroidal you can follow these branches all the way back to the P1 and use them as a trail marker. So the, the arteries, as it turns out, are a nice uh, landmark as well that take you along your dissection pathway. So here's the journey for the peduncular ones. It's very similar, following the branches down the sylvian fissure, out the choroidal artery to the PCA. But when we hit the PCA, instead of turning left, we're gonna turn right and follow the P2A segment over to the peduncle. The tegmental lesions rely on the branches of the superior cerebellar artery, the S4 and the S3. Same with the quadrigeminal. We just have these uh, vermian branches rather than the more lateral branches that we follow. The periaqueductal vessels, we follow the ACA vessels to split the inner hemispheric fissure and get into the um, corpus callosum in the third ventricle. Uh, here, the basilar, uh, Vessels were, were following branches of ICA around the corner. Peritrigeminal, we're following the uh, SCA branches around the corner. Here, the middle cerebellar peduncle uh, lesion, again, following the distal branches of ICA into that petrosal fissure, splitting the fissure into that uh, interlobular triangular space and on down. For the uh, lower lesions, the branches of pica can help lead us there. Here, the inferior peduncular uh, or um, P3 segment of pica will take us there. Same with the, the rhomboid lesions, these distal P3 branches can lead us upwards and so forth. The super olivary is shown here. Here's the pyramidal. We're looking for VBJ and the branches of the anterior spinal artery. And for olivary, uh, we often see the uh, P2 segment of pica uh, right uh, in this zone by the olive. And then finally, um, the trigonal, we've talked about that already. Uh, these distal branches of pica can take you to these, uh, these final uh, uh, subtypes. 
So uh, again, a summary slide just showing that uh, arteries are your friends. Uh, if you are able to find an artery uh, along your dissection pathway, that will help lead you to your targets and get you there safely. Um, I'll just finish with cartography, this idea that um, uh, maps can uh, uh, be um, helpful. Uh, those images you've been seeing in this presentation are uh, basically medical maps. Um, this is a, a map of a ski hill. And um, you know, if you're a skier and um, you're trying to learn the terrain of the mountain, these ski maps are incredibly valuable because they take you uh, right to the run that you're interested in and they keep you from getting lost. Well, uh, the analogy for the brainstem is the same. You know, the, the, um, the map is uh, all of the things we've been talking about, how you synthesize the types and the subtypes and the taxonomy. The trailheads are like your craniotomy. The approaches are like your trail that takes you there. And these triangles and these arteries are these waypoints. They're these landmarks that you find on your journey that will help uh, steer you in the right direction. Ultimately, you, you reach your, your pathology, the cavernoma, or uh, if they're below the surface, you need to get to that safe entry zone to get in there. So um, these are just some examples. This is, a, uh, this is a, a plain carré map or a rectangular map. And um, here's a, a summary of all of the concepts we've been talking about. The, the 16 different subtypes are shown in the colored zones and the arrows show you the different surgical approaches. Um, here's another view. This is, a, this is um, the um, equidistant maps where the, the globe is circularized. And if you think of the, uh, the map in the same way, you can put all of your different uh, landmarks there. Uh, this is the subway map of New York. And um, uh, you can think of the arterial uh, segments as um, different lines on the subway and you can use uh, them to get to your destination. And then here's some beautiful art from Peter, uh, just showing um, these different uh, segments of the arteries that will lead you to these different patches or zones of the subtypes, uh, different views showing the same. So, um, you know, just to wrap this up, um, uh, the whole point of um, all of this work is safe passage. You wanna select your patients appropriately. You wanna pick the right approach. Uh, you wanna um, uh, rehearse the operation in your mind before you get into the operating room. You wanna use all of these clues interoperatively to, to get you there safely. And um, you know to get the best outcomes, you have to really execute uh, uh, in a way that's safe and clean. So um, you know, I, I just wanna um, finish on that note. Um, you know, the, the uh, conclusions of the talk are that, you know, this hopefully gives you a, a framework uh, to think about brainstem cavernous malformations. The taxonomy is at the center of this. It um, uh, will help you identify which lesion we're, you're dealing with. Um, the bedside exam, I think, is really important with these patients. There are discrete signs and symptoms that will help you uh, figure out what subtype you're dealing with. Um, it will improve your acumen. Before you order your MRI, you can know exactly which subtype you're dealing with. Um, the subtype specifies the craniotomy, the surgical approach, the triangle, and the safe entry zone. And those are really important pieces as you go through. And if you put it all together, I think the, the bottom line is that the patients will do better. You'll make the right choices, you'll do the right surgery, and hopefully get them the result they're looking for. So uh, with that, I uh, will stop. Um, let me stop my share and exit here. And um, thank you for uh, thank you for letting me speak. Thank you so again, much, sir. Apologies for the lack of video. I don't know what's going on with my my video, but uh, it's not showing me. Thank you so much, sir. Honor and pleasure is all ours. And thank you again for your state of the art lecture, indeed, as expected. I think um, uh, I've got my camera issue as well here. I think it's a problem relevant with Zoom right now. Sir, again, thank you so much. And like you have exemplified the cavernous malformations, um, you have uh, used the metaphor of maps. I think that we are really ple pleased and uh, obliged to have you leading us right through the deep uh, and dark corridors right into those caverns so again thanks a lot sir sir it was generally said that the uh, 
when we say stem, uh, the brain stem cavernomas to be surgically accessible, it is generally a very wide term that can be interpreted differently depending upon one's institution and their own experiences. So um, that you have uh, mentioned very nicely all this neuroanatomy. I think the one important thing right now for us to is know is the uh, is a right uh, neuroanatomy um, to have a very clear view, of course, for surgical planning and for lesion uh, location. But sir, what do you think about this? notion and when we say that surgical accessibility basically depends a lot upon um, you know one's own experience of course it is very important but how can we uh, improve especially those uh, who are uh, in in area where neurosurgery is still under the developing phases so what would you kindly suggest us to do to have a better uh, to select a better approach and to give better results and um, be able to operate on most of the cases yeah, well, I think it all boils down to um, knowing your anatomy. Um, I think um, uh, th these cases are very rare. It's true. I, I've been at, uh, at this for 25 years, and um, I've done probably 350 of these. And um, it's not a lot. But I think you can learn by studying the anatomy in the cadaver lab. Um, a lot of what I've been sharing with you is, is really um, discoverable um, just through cadaveric dissection and learning the relationships between the nerves and the arteries and the surfaces. And, um, you know, I think um, hopefully there's some value in what I've presented. I think sometimes you just, um, if you can think about a problem like the brainstem cavernous malformation with some concepts and those concepts provide some clarity or, or they make you understand things that were previously maybe a little chaotic, then people all of a sudden figure it out. And, and hopefully that's what um, seven cavernomas will do. I, I do feel like, um, you know, I, I, um, I see patients um, films all the time. People send me films for review because they're not sure which uh, approach to select or how to manage a particular problem. And I think um, part of it is that um, we just haven't boiled it down and put it together like this. And, and hopefully, um, by creating a system of, of uh, a taxonomy and approaches and so forth, um, people will start to see some of the order and the chaos and it'll become a little clearer. Absolutely, sir. Sir, do you think that there, um, like you have um, mentioned several times, that you think that AI can be somewhat helpful for us later on in um, planning uh, surgery in one way or other? So there is a new technique where people are trying to uh, 3D print uh, the models uh, of their patients according to their brain scans and they say that it can be helpful for them to learn more about the particular patient and select the good uh, uh surgical approach so do you think this uh, way yeah it's a it's a good question i, I think um ai is very powerful and i'm a huge fan but um honestly um i'm conflicted i, I sometimes feel like um we're better off training our minds because our mind is the is the greatest computer in the universe and um if we if we teach concepts and we train our minds to be um, analytical, I sometimes feel like that's the better way to go. Um, AI is going to spit out an uh, an answer, and it's not going to always account for the, the all the different vari variables that are in play. Like um, a lesion is never going to be a sphere; it's always going to have some uh, abnormal shapes to it, and those are the kinds of things that you look for to exploit in making these decisions and um you know honestly um i i think it's it's probably better I, i've i've come to the conclusion that i'd rather spend my time teaching the next generation all of you guys to to really think through these um tough cases and get smart about it rather than just building an algorithm and putting it on an app on an iphone somewhere so that you can have this black box spit you uh, a program or a, an approach. I, I I feel like um, you know, by us getting smarter, uh, we'll probably be better off in the long run. 
In, indeed, the facts are obviously nobody can actually replace the, the human brain and it could be just, I think AI can be just a third eye uh, for, for a human, just an adjunct. Thank you so much, sir. So there is um, also a question regarding, um, uh, we generally believe that cavernomas uh, uh, do not uh, like uh, arise de novo and whenever there is a recurrence of a cavernoma, it is uh, generally uh, from the residual rather than arising on its own. And uh, like you have very nicely mentioned the right angle method uh, for the blind spots. So uh, what do you uh, think that, what would you kindly suggest uh, about uh, these uh, residuals, especially because we all, there is a dilemma of safe resection um, in these precarious lesions, these precarious areas rather. So uh, if we say that we need to have this safe resection and um, we also have this fear of leaving remnants behind and the fear of recurrence. So I've got uh, two questions right now. Uh, do you think that uh, endoscopy can be a good adjunct in that way in, in the visualization? And uh, would you like to suggest that in case of recurrence, should we go for um, like some sort of radio surgery, especially um, if the surgical experience is not that good? Uh, or would you, uh, what would be your kind of suggestion? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, this will be my last uh, question. Then I have to run. I'm sorry, but um, the the um, uh, problem of recurrence is difficult because you you always want to get all of the lesion and get a complete curative removal the first time. But you have to remember that you're in the brainstem first of all, and you don't have the luxury of um, getting into the tissue and and um, being overly aggressive because that causes incredible harm to the patient. Second, these are long approaches, so there are naturally going to be blind spots. So I think um, the whole point of the right angle rule was to just get you dialed into or tuned into these blind spots so that you're less likely to, to have a problem there. Um, and then your, your question about um, radio surgery for remnants is, uh, I, I'm a pretty staunch uh, opponent of radio surgery for uh, cavernomas because um, I just don't believe that they're uh, that the therapy is effective. I think you need arterial tissue for radiation to do its thing. And there is an arterial tissue, obviously, in cavernous malformations. So I think you're subjecting patients to the risks of radiation without significant or any benefit. And I, I don't recommend that. Okay. So um, uh, anyway, um, th those are my answers. I really appreciate you inviting me. This is a wonderful thing you're doing. I was noticing the numbers. You've uh, attracted a big uh, audience here, and I appreciate that. And I congratulate you on putting this together. So thank you so much for your very kind word. It means so much to me, sir. Thank you so much for your very encouraging words. It means a lot to me coming from you. I'm a big fan of yours and you're a huge inspiration. I try my best not to miss your lectures and I go through your recordings so much. And I think that you have done an incredible job in educating everyone from around the world and people like me owe a lot to you. So I don't think that I have got words to thank you for what you have done for us. Um, because well, I it's think my that pleasure. And now it's my pleasure. Pleasure and honor is all and thank you so much for your time sir okay. it's a bit, and i think we kept you for so long i think you have got a uh, got a meeting to then i'm so sorry for keeping you this long but again thank you so much sir i do think that you're words, welcome words fall you're welcome. have a have a great rest of your evening and a great weekend have a bye everybody day, goodbye everybody. thank you so much sir thank you so much for coming Uh, thank you all for coming today. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. I can see so many people here and so many on the YouTube as well. So it's a, um, it's a matter of great honor to have you all with us today. And I hope that you will join us uh, on 19 February to attend uh, our lecture with Professor Spessler. Uh, he will be delivering a lecture on, of course, the AVMs. So I think that uh, everyone will be there. Yes, the certificates will be given to you all, uh, but it will take a little while. Um, and to uh, you know to email all the certificates so regarding the neuroanatomy course uh, i have received um, 
a lot of good response from all of you. So uh, I think it's just a basic uh, neuroanatomy course where I will try my best to give you an insider, an overview um, of the basic neuroanatomy, which I think that everyone should know. And uh, I will add a few clinical correlates and radiograph radiographs uh, to have a good, uh, you know, um, experience. But I consider that is uh, quite, 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 quite basic. So uh, again, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. But this course will be, um, you know, uh, uploaded on edX. I think in a month's time at least. Uh, but uh, maybe earlier, if we, if I just uh, record to get record everything and get it uploaded. Uh, but I will certainly um, update. Uh, the release date of this course on my WhatsApp, uh, the WhatsApp group. I think all you all of you have received the link to my WhatsApp group, and please do keep um, updated from my website. Uh, I, uh, so you can just uh, have a good, uh, you know updates from our side. We are uh, doing so many new things. We are introducing so many new projects and we are also going to release a book on basic neuro uh, neurosurgical approaches this year, later this year, and uh, there is a visual novel that will also be released by us. And the visual novel is uh, basically a novel where uh, you can be interactive. And I um, request all the senior neurosurgeons and all of my colleagues who have um, good cases, I really want to request them to contribute in this uh, visual novel so that we can have a good um, you know, selection of um, cases to share with our colleagues and our friends. The, basically, the privilege that we have got in the visual novel is that we can actually interact uh, in it and can make a choice. Uh, like um, maybe you put a, I put forward to a case and you have to make a choice, but would you go you were, would you do in that case so it's like uh, you are learning it on in a very nice way so it will be i think helpful uh, especially for the for the residents so again i really want you to send me more ideas and anything you want to know about and i will be pleased to um you know uh, uh to again so i will be pleased to um uh, organize webinars accordingly. These are the webinars that I think that could be helpful for all of us because uh, it's not been long since I was myself a trainee. So I can just really well relate to it. So again, I really wish you uh, thank, uh, and thank you all for this huge honor and I hope to see you again um, soon. So uh, uh, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you all. And uh, thank you to all the wonderful seniors. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Adrian, for coming. And I can see a few other very respective professors um, who were here with us during the uh, during the webinar. And I'm, I'm really personally um, so much grateful to all the seniors for the nice words and for uh, for promoting, for encouraging me from doing this. And again, thank you very, very much. The recording is available on YouTube now. So I think it's time to wrap.